Hello everyone, my name is Peter Adler and uh, I'm very proud to have been one of the co-conveners of some workshops on joint fact-finding recently. Uh, Jack, joint fact-finding is a collaboration process in which people work together to try to find solutions to tough problems, usually public policy problems, but others as well. And joint fact-finding, or JFF, is one version of many different methods. We've all been to public meetings, some of you would be familiar with mediation, some of you are familiar with facilitation. Joint fact-finding is a mediated process or facilitated process in which people come together to try to narrow, if not actually resolve, factual disagreements. Uh, very often those scientific and technical disagreements are used as a sword or a shield. We're all familiar with dueling experts and uh, dueling philosophies, but the idea is can we get to the center of the storm factually and try to narrow down what really is uh, evidence for facts and what isn't. For the past uh, week, about 30 people have been uh, come in from Asia, the Pacific, and from Hawaii and from the mainland to explore and take stock of the use of this method of joint fact-finding, which has been around for some 20, 20 years. And uh, to really try to understand what works, what doesn't work, when is it appropriate, when is it not appropriate, uh, what is its highest and best use, and most of all, how can we accelerate the uptake of these processes for appropriate situations. Um, we have some experience with this here in Hawaii. It's been used on geothermal issues on the Big Island. Uh, it's been used on Kauai on issues related to vacation rentals, assembling the factual basis uh, and really trying to cut down some of the unnecessary friction over uh, arguments about facts. And uh, it is in the process of being applied to many other situations here. So what you're about to see is a uh, uh, the public workshop in which some 80 people came together, mostly leaders from Hawaii's uh, government agencies and uh, the civic sector and the private sector, to hear a briefing on what went on at the workshop and to have a chance to hear some actual cases and to ask questions about this. Uh, this is a, a, a very, very fine process used appropriately. It cannot resolve all matters. It's not a panacea, but it is a step above many of the, the usual informational meetings that are held when there's a hot issue, and we think this has a bright future in Hawaii. Our life experience in Vienna has totally transformed 
heavy, you know, because of the mass earthquake and tsunami. And well, there wasn't actually much physical damage in Tokyo, you know, my city. And actually, the damage that was caused in science because we are told that earthquakes can be easily predicted or you know, nuclear coupling could never collapse in any event, which yeah, turned out to be false. So, but, but, but still, we can't ignore the power of science and knowledge in public policy making or even law making. Right? So, with the support of Japan Science and Technology Agency, which is a part of the government, I have been uh, leading a project called Integrating Joint Park Finding in the Policy Making Policy for the last three years. And it's a purely uh, international uh, project relying on the based on Peter and Scott and Julian uh, and other fine experts of Hawaii and also other mainland states. So now Peter is now based in Hawaii and also you know it's a midway between mainland and Japan. Uh, yeah, right? So that means Hawaii is has become the ideal hub of both scientific debates or practical discourse or dialogue on this subject. So I'm looking forward to a really great discussion this afternoon. And finally, I'd like to thank the uh, organization to support us for this uh, to make this workshop possible. So first one is Collaborative Religious Network, and also Hawaii State Bar Association's ADL section, and the International Law Foundation, and Maximum Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, College of Social Sciences, Public Policy Center, and lastly, Richardson uh, School of Law at the University of Hawaii. So thank you very much for this conference, and I uh, really be looking forward to an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Masa. All right. um, I also wanted to let Cindy say a word. Uh, we're today, the refreshments and some of our presence is being sponsored by the Bar Association. So Cindy, I know this is a piece of some interest that the ADR section, you want to say a quick word on that? Well, I just want to say that it's a pleasure uh, on behalf of the Hawaii State Bar Association Alternative Dispute Resolution Session. I'm a co-chair. Um, my other co-chair, Lee Chen, will be here a little bit later. And uh, Chuck Hurd, who is also a co-chair, is traveling, so he's not uh, here uh, to be here today. But it is our pleasure to be able to uh, help to sponsor uh, today's program. Uh, this is the second in a series of programs that the ADR section is helping to sponsor. It is our goal that um, we would be able to help uh, Hawaii solve some of uh, the most difficult issues through collaboration and ADR processes, and um, that is our goal in uh, to sponsor today's program. So thank you for the Thank you, Cindy. Uh, so one of, one of a mentor for Juliana, Scott, and many others uh, was a guy named Frank Sander. He's still alive. He's getting pretty old. And David Matson's honestly there. Yeah. So, so Frank was one of the pioneers of using alternative dispute resolution, especially in the courts. And it was his philosophy. He said, you know, we got to figure out a way to let the forum create the forum or imagine the forum to fit the right fuss, because not every fuss ought to be going through the the same machine, whether it's political or legal. So I take uh, comfort from that, and that's been a, a bit of a guiding principle. So it's a question of how do we begin to continue to sort of fashion the right situation and the right timing and the right venue and the right form for the right problem. This is actually a, a picture of a kipuka. And Robbie Ong, who was a member of our worship, couldn't be here today, but sent his better half, as you can see. So Ro Robbie actually started us off with a wonderful set of remarks. We said, you know, we are like, when it comes to many of our public issues, whether it's rail or GMO or some of the energy issues, it's sort of like a, a, a long field of lost scorched earth, which we know will regrow. But he said there are kipukas, little green places where birds and plants find refuge. And that's been a metaphor for us in the last two days to say, how do we create the right little kipuka for the right kind of situation where people can do some reasoning together who normally oppose each other, but who are committed to a little civil discourse. So the idea is Kipuka has been a powerful metaphor. This method called joint fact-finding goes by many names. And so you will hear a little bit of these names sprinkled in. It isn't one thing, it's many things. You'll hear it sometimes as called an independent review panel or a technical advisory group or a stakeholder panel working group, or a study group, or a peer review meeting, stakeholder panels, dialogues, roundtables, science advisory board. It goes by many different names. So you have to think about this as not being one thing, but something that can have many different forms and 
but usually with some common functions. So, uh, oh, that came out kind of weird. Um, so I think of this as a, a bit of a, a Venn. And in the Venn, there are three sides to this. One is, how do we have a method or a set of methods that can improve some of our public decisions? Not by replacing them with the, the if we have good, solid institutions, but how do we add to those and improve public policy decisions? Second, how do we really bring good, technical, scientific, economic, legal, political, whatever the information, the data is, how do we bring that onto the table? And then, in the spirit of all ADRs, can we enhance the cooperation and reduce some of the unnecessary friction? Some of the friction is very important. That's how we change, that's how our society moves. But can we streamline it a bit so we go to the heart of the big issues? Um, a reminder that we are talking about a form of collaboration, and in any collaboration there are some sequences of steps, and for two and a half days we've been parsing these into the finest set of bologna and salami you could possibly imagine, with academics in the room and practitioners. But there is a set of stages, and the first wall, whether it's a mediation or whether it's any other process, the first one is some form of entry, some form of portfolio, some initial traction so that you can go to the second stage, which is to scope these things out and appraise and assess and gain some insight into is it appropriate, is it the right timing, and so on. Cam Lowry and I uh, recently went to Malaysia to work on a, a very difficult to assess a mining problem, and the conclusion was the timing's not right. There's an election, there were several pending court actions, and there will be a moment later, windows open, windows close. So there's a, a, some appraisal that goes on. Um, then there's this planning. What's the choreography? What's the stages? What's the sequence? And uh, so it's creating a, some sort of a plan and bringing people together and getting organized for that. Then the deliberation, the deep dive into issues, into information, and into the values. We know that value issues are at play here. So discussion of that as well. So it's not just give me the facts and nothing but the facts. Uh, and then there is getting some agreements, reaching some agreements on those things that can be agreed to, producing and memorialize those, and delivering those. So this is a general sketch, not different than a settlement conference, not different than the mediations and commercial matters, general stages. And as we talk for two and a half days, some have 12-step processes, some have three-step processes, <coughs> it doesn't matter. Um, so a few cautions. The first, as we talk about JFF, this is not a panacea. This cannot fix everything. Uh, cannot fix all the shortcomings and painful pieces of our machinery, our political and legal machinery. Uh, and, but it can add significantly to better decision making if we can accelerate the use of this appropriately. I, I say appropriate is the key word. Second thing is, this is additive. So the goal isn't to replace the courts or to replace litigation or to replace uh, political decision making, it's a complement to it. It's not a replacement. It's important because sometimes people get carried away and think this should all be, everything should be just this. <clears throat> Third is that it has some greater utilities and some lesser utilities, we think. Uh, in general, this is, seems to lend itself, this particular process lends itself to problems in which people can bring data People can bring evidence. People can be persuasive to each other uh, where there's information available. And the, and the joint fact-finding process is a sorting and an amalgamation of those things. So for example, uh, fact-centered problems might be how many animals and plants are in danger? How will this new road affect drive times? What levels do emissions become toxic? <coughs> those are problems to which we can have a discussion, a deliberation. We can bring evidence to the table. We can see how persuasive those things are, and always in the face of some uncertainty. This may be less useful uh, or be a part of value-centered discussions. And those are, which animals and plants should we prioritize for recovery? Shall we put this rare mosquito on the list, or shall we put this panda on the list? I mean, that, that's a value decision that the fact process could inform but not answer. Or how will this new road affect our lifestyle? That's one that needs really good value conversations. Um, it has specific uses, as you will hear. You can use this to work on agreements 
on the questions that need to be focused and addressed. You can use it to narrow uh, the, the range of disagreements and say, here's the heart of the issue. These things, secondary, tertiary. You could use this uh, to agree on the kinds of expertise and the kinds of disciplines that might be needed for a further inquiry. You could use this, as it has been done on geothermal and some others, to design the right study and everything. We have a good consensus on this study. You could use it to create very specialized work products that might inform the policy debate, agreed upon forecasts, trends, estimates, and so on. So the whole idea is to focus not exclusively, but to take the factual questions that are in dispute and really hit those hard and in some new ways. Um, the last thing is that this can take two different forms. It can actually take many forms. But the two we're talking about is, one, it can be a standalone process where somebody says, we just want to do this fat fighting on this. We want to convene a group, put their heads together, design the process, and, get, and just address a fairly narrow set of issues, uh, whatever the outputs might be. And, or it can be embedded in a longer process. We might say, this is a long-running policy dialogue on rail, and here's the fat pieces right now, but the rail issue will go on. Geothermal's going on for 25 years. GMO may go on for 25 years. The question is, can we begin to do some streamlining? So that's it, and with that, I'm going to ask Kim and our panel to come up. So Peter has provided us uh, a brief overview of joint fact-finding, and those of you who have been involved in mediation and facilitation and negotiation <coughs> will uh, recognize some familiar features. Uh, we're going to have a panel now uh, to talk about some experiences in joint fact-finding and give you a little more context for how it works. Uh, the proof of any set of uh, skills is in the application, and we have some people today who are very experienced practitioners. They're what I like to think of as reflective practitioners. That is to say, they're really interested in learning about their practice and what works and what doesn't work and how to make it better. Uh, so these are all people who have, in various ways, dug deeply into their experience to reflect on what's best and what doesn't work. Um, Having said that, we're not going to give them enough time to dig all that deeply. In <laughs> so we have a, we're putting a premium on having them tell a story that will highlight some of the things that Peter talked about. Uh, the first speaker uh, on my right is Dr. Scott McCreary. Scott is president and managing principal at Concur Incorporated. He serves as senior facilitator and mediator specializing in multi-party deliberations involving water management, marine resources, land use, species protection, air quality, climate adaptation, renewable energy, and other complex natural resource issues. Scott focuses on finding effective ways to bring research and analysis into environmental decision-making processes. He's facilitated about a dozen complex joint fact-finding fact processes as part of his core professional practice and facilitation, and another 10 or 20 projects uh, that include a strong joint fact-finding component. And today he's going to talk about cow-fed water efficiency. Good. Kim, thanks very much, and thanks to Peter and all of you for giving up part of your Saturday afternoon for this. So I'm going to tell you a short story about uh, a part of the California water wars, uh, which are still going on, to be sure. Uh, we had a massive environmental planning program called the CalFed Bay Delta Program, whose aim it was to simultaneously improve the way we deal with water supply delivery, species protection, and flood control in the Bay Delta and all of its tributaries. And part of this work was to put together a series of planning components. One was on water use efficiency and looking specifically at water conservation potential in agriculture. The organizers of this planning process thought it would be a good idea to get about 40 or 50 stakeholders in the room and hire one consultant to do a study of water conservation potential in California. So they did that. Uh, interestingly, there was a bipartisan critique of the accuracy and precision of this, of this analysis. 
That is to say, the conservation community disputed it, so did the agricultural community. One of the problems was the, just the name of it, water conservation potential. Agriculture said, well, we're, we're very conserving. We conserve as much as we need to. And the environmental community said, well, no, you're not. You're not doing nearly enough. Look, in the urban sector, we have all these best management practices. Why aren't you doing that? So an impasse was brewing. And through a series of internal conversations, the decision was made to organize a joint fact-finding process around this report and its analysis of water conservation potential in California. The structure of this was that I worked alongside with the program manager, and we recruited a panel of five different experts from different disciplines, uh, irrigation engineering, hydrology, soil science, and we set out to do a very specific critique of the report. And we set up a, the first meeting and said, please talk about best management practices. We got the panel together. They came in the room and they said, these are the wrong questions. You have asked us the wrong questions. Let's spend the day scoping out what appropriate questions would be. This meeting was a public meeting. And so we elicited from the interested stakeholders their suggestions on the key questions. And we spent the day preparing to really have an effective deliberation. So that was a day well spent, but kind of a detour from where we meant to go. Two months later, we did convene the panel, and they delved very deeply into this report. They critiqued the, the findings of the overall conservation potential number. They critiqued the methodology. They critiqued the data sources. And they critiqued the outputs. But they didn't just critique. They said, here are the problems, and here are all the ways this could be done better. Here's the conceptual model you should be working with in really thinking about water use efficiency in California. You should use the concept of flow paths because water delivered in the spring is very different in terms of ecological benefit compared to water delivered in the fall or the, or the winter. You should look at targeted benefits. You should really try to quantify the value of moving water around for ecosystem uh, restoration and conservation purposes. And you should not rely so heavily on a regulatory approach. You should come up with an incentive-based approach that rewards people for making commitments to try to meet these targeted benefits. At this point in time, this process was what Peter would call a standalone process. It was just a scientific review of a report. Coincidentally, there was a group of stakeholders and planners putting together the planning recommendation for the Bay Delta program. And all of the other ones were mostly developed by staff. The water use efficiency program actually uh, accepted the scientific review panel's report, and they used it as the foundation for their own consensus-based decision-making process. They came up with the water use efficiency component of the CalFed plan. It was adopted in its entirety in the record of decision, the only piece of the plan developed that way. And it then became the foundation for a 90 to $100 million program of grants and loans that were made for water use efficiency in the agricultural sector. So while it started, if you think of Peter's diagram of the diverged roads, this road curved back into the core planning process delivered uh, the platform for a consensus agreement, which was implemented in federal law and then in uh, financial commitments.